Hey everyone, it's Anastasia and welcome back to my channel. So today it's a little bit more of a casual video because we're doing a thousand subscriber Q&A. And I heard a lot of complaints that Corky wasn't in the last few videos, so he's here for the Q&A as well. From recursive underscore FN. In general, what kinds of problems are software developers working on in quantum computing? There's a lot of stuff to do here for computer scientists, whether you want to be really involved on the actual quantum side or just work with a quantum company and do stuff that's not quantum related. So of course there's people working on algorithms, efficient algorithms, quantum error correction, all that stuff on one end, but there's also people working on the middleware and how the actual hardware talks to the quantum chip because a lot of these quantum computing systems are moving to the cloud. There's a lot of developers working on that entire infrastructure, the front end, the back end. It's a whole web app and then you also have to consider that you're putting a quantum computer connection into it. There's people working on building quantum programming languages themselves. So you've heard of TensorFlow Quantum and Circ and Qiskit and Q Sharp and Silk and all these programming languages. There's a whole team of software developers working on those quantum programming languages. So there's also a lot of opportunities there. So whatever kind of background you have and whatever you want to work on, whether it's front end stuff or back end stuff or working with a quantum computer itself, I think you can find a place for yourself in the quantum ecosystem. So next we have from Satyam.004. I want to become a quantum computing scientist. I'm joining college next month for CS engineering. Please help. So if you're just starting college, you're at a great place to study this new field because a lot more universities are having classes in quantum computing and now you have access to all these cloud platforms. So I'd say for computer scientists, you should really take physics and take those quantum mechanics classes and take the quantum computing classes if you have them and study that because you're going to need that if you want to be in the field. Also take statistics, take as much math as you can. I think that's one of my biggest regrets in college is not taking more math classes. Linear algebra is huge in quantum, so make sure you take that. For my university, that was covered in calculus too, but a lot of universities have it as a separate class. So just make sure you have that background as well. I always say the physics classes really help me solidify my math concepts. So then when you take those physics classes, you'll really understand the mathematics behind it. Other than that, just get involved in research. I think that's also really important. If you have that available at your university, get into a lab, work with your hands, go to conferences, all those things to just meet people in the field and understand what is going on in the field and figure out if you want to get into the atomic physics side, right? So if you want to work with neutral atoms or trapped ions, or if you want to work on superconducting qubits, you probably need to do more solid state physics. All right, next question is from nature underscore ND. There appears to be a race to breaking encryption with quantum first. I'd love to hear the details on how, why, and the consequences. So Shor's algorithm can break RSA and elliptic curve cryptography, which is a problem because a lot of our data these days is encrypted with those two algorithms. Quantum computers are not faster at everything. They're just faster at certain problems, and it just happens that this RSA and elliptic curve encryption fall under that umbrella. But there are other encryption algorithms that are not affected by quantum computers, and we have to discover them and then actually implement them and put them into action before a large enough quantum computer actually emerges. Now, this requires a huge amount of qubits, something like 10 million qubits estimated, but it was one of the first discoveries of what practical application that quantum computers can actually do. It harnesses quantum properties to actually factor numbers a lot faster, and this is the whole core of the security behind RSA encryption. The consequences of this is that our data is not gonna be secure anymore if we get a big enough quantum computer. So we're gonna have to do something about it. So there's a field of study called post-quantum cryptography, which means they use no quantum properties at all to encrypt data. So everyone always asks me, are quantum computers going to destroy Bitcoin? Bitcoin is encrypted using elliptic curve cryptography. So yes, it is vulnerable to quantum computers. I wrote a whole article about this, so I'm gonna post that below as well. And I'll probably make a new YouTube video talking about that because I feel like I can talk about this for ages. But yes, you should kind of worry, but not anytime soon. Like you don't need to move your Bitcoin today to some other quantum secure wallet. I wouldn't worry about that at all. But in general, how do we upgrade the blockchain? We can fork it and moving forward, everything will be fine, assuming we find a good quantum secure algorithm. But what are we gonna do with all the old coins or the coins that have their private keys lost? Are we just gonna say, sorry, bye, like this, this part of the chain will no longer be valid unless you move it and re-encrypt it? Or are we gonna find new technologies? So it's actually a really interesting topic. And again, we have a lot of time to think about this, but I'll post all that below. 
Next question is from Matt O'Flynn. He has an amazing fun facts of the day videos on TikTok, by the way, so you should follow him there. What do you think quantum computers will be used for first? So we're in the NISC era. So this is the noisy intermediate scale quantum computing era. The state of the art systems right now have about 50 to 100 qubits, so we're nowhere close to doing things like Shor's algorithm. However, there's a bunch of algorithms out there that can actually have an impact even with such a small amount of qubits. One of these algorithms is called the variational quantum eigensolver, and we think we can apply it to things like optimization problems or quantum chemistry. VQE is really suited for solving certain optimization problems, and that makes it really broad reaching and really exciting. You can use it as a hybrid algorithm and have classical parts and quantum parts and make the algorithm even stronger. So financial companies are looking into VQE for portfolio optimization, for example. One of the most exciting near-term applications, I think for me, is quantum chemistry. You can use VQE to simulate molecules and figure out their ground state energies. And we think that eventually this VQE algorithm can help with drug development or discovery. So just in the little interruption, I just wanted to say thank you for you all who have been supporting me on TikTok, Instagram, on YouTube. This just means a lot to me. I never thought that I would be able to make these sort of videos and post them on YouTube. I actually, I actually filmed my first YouTube video in I think 2017, maybe 2016, and I went through the whole process where I wrote out a script and I edited everything and put it together and I just, was way too embarrassed to post it. So being here now and seeing all y'all looking at my videos and liking them and being inspired by them and getting into coding for quantum systems or learning Golang or making an AI project, it's just been so rewarding and I wanna keep doing that. I actually got a message recently from someone that said they're going back to college to study physics. They had dropped out because they really didn't know what they wanted to study. And my videos helped them kind of see that quantum computing was this exciting field and now they're going back to college. And that just means so much to me and I think that's so cool. So I'm really excited to just keep making videos and always let me know if you're interested in something for me to make. I'm always looking for new ideas. From Suddenly Kelp, what makes quantum computing so difficult to learn? I think one of the big difficulties of learning quantum computing is that we just have a lot of terminology that doesn't exist in other fields and you have to know that to understand a lot of the work that's going on. For instance, Dirac notation is pretty similar to vectors, but when you hear a Dirac notation, you think it's something super fancy and they look like this, which is something that you've probably never seen before unless you're in a quantum mechanics class. But when you actually explain it to someone, it is pretty basic of a concept. But when you're hit in the face with all these terms and concepts and it, it just gets really overwhelming and a lot of people quit right there. That said, I think scientists do use a lot of fancy terms and words. One is because we've been taught to do that and a lot of people that we talk to are scientists in the same field. But two, sometimes people think you sound smarter or are smarter if you use bigger words. And I think that's a problem and we should make sure to not do that to get more people involved in quantum computing. I've actually done a quantum glossary TikTok series and I'm thinking of doing that on YouTube Shorts as well, so let me know if you want that. But I think that would help a lot of people get into the field when they realize all these terms really aren't that scary. And another thing is, it's just a new concept to wrap your mind around and it doesn't work like classical physics and that's what you're used to in real life. You're used to how the world works classically and now quantum's a little bit different. So sometimes it takes a little bit for things to just click and to you accept that kind of new reality from Jose Luis underscore GST. What got you interested in quantum computing? Were you a math physics major before diving into QM? So I got into quantum computing really randomly and I think that's a really unsatisfying answer to a lot of people. They think I had this grand plan, but like I mentioned, nobody really cared about quantum when I first got into college. I declared as a computer science major and I took the first Python class and it was good and I liked it. I got a good grade, but I wanted to use computers as a tool for other problems that I was solving and not study it as the main thing. So then I started looking more into the sciences. I did a research internship in a chemical engineering lab in drug delivery. So that was really interesting. I got interested in that, transferred to a biology major, actually thought I might do med school, kind of looked at a bunch of other topics and then I took physics and I liked it and I transferred into the physics major. 
After that, I started looking for research there as well because I've been doing it in chemical engineering and I wanted to do it in physics as well to really see if that's what I wanted to do. And I applied to a couple labs. The first one I talked to, I think it was biophysics, maybe astrophysics, I don't remember. And they said they only take third years. They want you to have taken optics before you join the lab. And the second lab said, yes, come on in. Uh, I kind of came in and said, I know how to solder, you know, take me, let me work on electronics. And they took me and it was a quantum telecommunications lab. So I got into quantum really early and randomly and I realized I liked it. Something I really liked about physics is that it was actually kind of hard and I really had to struggle through it. So I felt like I was learning in biology. I liked it, but I felt like there was a lot of memorizing. So I really didn't want to do that. That wasn't how I felt like learning was like. And physics was just sometimes you get one problem set and it would be two questions and that would take you weeks to do that. But to me, it felt like such an interesting view into the world from underscore dandelion. Any advice for an undergraduate who wants to get into quantum computing but doesn't have the resources for it available at their university? So at least in the US, there's a lot of programs to help you with that. So there's the NSF REU program, and I believe you can apply if you're from any university and studying that field, you can go to another university in the summer and do research there. So I'd really recommend looking into that. Another thing is now there's actually cloud quantum computing systems and we didn't have that when I was an undergraduate. And so now you can actually do research on your own on these systems for free and do your own experiments and explore that and learn the quantum programming languages. And that's, I think, a huge asset if you're in school to actually spend some time doing projects like that. From Mal Karand on Instagram, is there much paid work in quantum computing yet or still mostly research? So there are jobs in quantum computing. There's a lot of companies right now in the quantum space that are hiring a lot of researchers, computer scientists, all sorts of people to help them build quantum computing chips. There's a lot of research going on, but there's also a lot of innovation, scaling other technology. So I'd say it's beyond pure research right now. Other companies are actually hiring quantum consultants to figure out what can they actually do with quantum computing once it becomes a real thing. I also think there's an emerging market in education right now by collaborating with different industries and actually teaching them more of these quantum concepts. That way other industries can start thinking of what problems that they have that quantum computers would actually be useful for. From Ezequiel Parini, can quantum be applied to finance? So yes, that's another field where this NISC era technology can actually be useful. So there's a few things you can do with quantum and finance and they have to do with optimization, machine learning. So there's some technology that I'll, I'll, I'll link the papers down below uh, so you can take a look, but you can actually use quantum computers to help with pricing derivatives or portfolio optimization. Those are all things that you can do with just 50 to 100 qubits. <laughs> Quirky, do you like dogs? Yes, this is Quirky. He's been with me for 10 years ever since before I even took my first quantum class. So he is truly a quantum dog. I know you all have been missing Quirky, and so he's right here napping through my video and getting really annoyed by how loudly I'm talking and going back to sleep now. From Polly Innovator, what do you do on a weekly basis? So I just recorded a podcast, Polycast, episode with Poly Innovators. On a weekly basis, I just kind of code a lot. So I work a lot with Golang and Python. Those are my two main languages. I also do some side projects with web app development, but I have such a hard time wrapping my head around JavaScript and all of that. I, do, I, just, I just don't get it. I don't like it. I like working in my backend life, but a lot of the time, yeah, I spend coding, especially because it's quarantine or we're not really going anywhere. And I'm spending a lot of time doing all this content creation. So that actually takes a long time to film, edit all these videos. So let me know if you want to see anything else and other types of videos. I'm always taking suggestions because I'm just starting this channel and it's kind of a new thing. And I want to know what you all want to actually hear. Besides that, we're also doing a lot of outreach activities for startups. You also have to do a lot with fundraising. So there's a lot of different things going on. And I think that's the exciting part of a startup is that you get to wear a lot of hats and you don't have to just be in your niche. You know, if you're a software engineer, yeah, you are going to do a lot of code, but also there's people helping out with, you know, finding new space and doing marketing and all this other stuff. So you can kind of try out a bunch of different roles in a startup. And I think that's the exciting part of this stressful sometimes too. And there's always a lot to do and there's always not enough hours in the day, but that's kind of how I like it. 
from emmanuel.ant. Would you recommend prioritizing learning Qiskit if applying to quantum computing internships? So I don't think you necessarily have to focus on Qiskit. There's a lot of quantum programming languages out there. So there's Circ from Google, there's Q Sharp from Microsoft, there's Silk, which is a new language that just came out that I haven't taken a look at yet, but you can code in a lot of different Python frameworks and languages, and you don't have to stick to just one. The thing is, this is similar to kind of computer science where once you know one, it's gonna make it a lot easier to learn the next one, so just pick one. Qiskit is great, Circ is great. You know, if you wanna get more into quantum machine learning, go to TensorFlow Quantum and start looking at that. So just start coding and just start trying things, and I think it'll be a lot easier to hop between different languages if you just know one. Now, if your goal is to only work at IBM, I mean, yeah, you should learn Qiskit. I think that would really help. But if you want to learn another language, I don't think that would preclude you from getting an internship at IBM because it shows that you know the quantum concepts and picking up Qiskit will be pretty easy for you. From JackML98, how did you raise as an early and highly technical startup? So raising as a really highly technical startup is really hard because a lot of venture capital firms want a really fast return and hardware is super expensive as well. With hard tech, biotech, quantum, the path to profitability and the path to getting to an IPO or another exit is really far away. And a lot of VC firms just don't specialize in that and they want the quickest return. Think of pharmaceutical companies that develop a product, you know, one product with a billion dollars and it takes 10 years. I mean, quantum and, and biotech is just very expensive. So I think it's just about finding the right partner. I think it's really important at the beginning as you're doing seed rounds and raising series A is to have VC firms and partners that really understand the technology because then they don't have unrealistic expectations. It's not like in two months we can build a quantum chip. But there's a lot of great venture capital firms out there that specialize in hard tech and they know exactly how much money and time and effort it takes. So it's a different kind of risk that they're taking, right? The risk that they're taking there is that the technology may never exist or it may not work, but the returns, if it does work, are just going to be way more massive than an average software company. So if you have those partners that understand, they can really help you make your company successful. So next from Quantumfied, inform people about the quantum ecosystem. So it's getting pretty big. It's crazy. When I was an undergrad, nobody really cared about quantum at all. Biophysics and astrophysics were the hot topics. and Astro is still kind of the cool kid on the block and we were kind of locked in the basement away from everyone else and all the normal people. So quantum physicists are like the weird people of physicists probably. So there's a lot of companies out there that are now doing quantum computing. And one of the best resources I found for looking at all the companies out there is this quantumcomputingreport.com. They list all the public and private companies doing quantum computing, research universities that are involved in quantum computing, nonprofits, and venture capital firms that are getting involved in the field. It's the most comprehensive resource I found and it's updated really often, but there's quantum computing companies popping up every day. So actually, let me tell you a secret since you're this far in the video, is that there's a quantum mentorship program opening up soon and I'll talk about it a little bit more on some other day, so keep an eye on this channel and my other social media. But if you wanna get involved with quantum computing and want a mentor, we'll have an available program for you very soon and it's actually not on this quantum computing report list I checked.